Welcome back to the Pilgrim Faith Podcast, where human wonder fuels the quest for Christian wisdom. Today, Dale and I are particularly delighted to be to, jo- to be joined by Dr. John Bolt, who is the editor of, uh, uh, if I if I recall, actually, uh, were you the editor of all four of the previous Boving volumes as well? Is that correct? I was. Yes, that's where it all got started with the yeah. Reform Dogmatics. We're- Reformed Dogmatics, and now uh, the second volume of uh, Reformed Ethics that uh, right. Dale and I just got in the mail. And so uh, uh, Dr. Bolt has been obviously then at the forefront of uh, this recent Bovink Renaissance, which which you know Dale and I try to keep up with the Bovink Renaissance. And so this is uh, one way of doing it. Maybe one way of getting into to this volume that I, I find fascinating is I suppose uh, uh, your own background, your own work, if I recall, is in Bavink's notion of the uh, imitation of Christ uh, in his theology. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's fairly close to the, the project of ethics. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how many, how many Bavink scholars writing in English were there when you, uh, when you, uh, you know, did your dissertation? Were there, was he the subject of many dissertations in English at that point, or was that well, pretty rare? No, it was very rare. Um, in fact, uh, there were only, well, uh, there were uh, four, I guess, living uh, theologians who had written dissertations on Bob Hink. Uh, one was uh, Professor Anthony Hukuma, mm-hmm. who um, had done a dissertation on Bob Hink's Theology of the Covenant. Mm. Um, the other was Dr. Eugene Heidemann, who contrasted Bavink with Emil Brunner on reason and revelation. And then uh, there was a uh, Dutch Reform minister, uh, Rolf Bremer, who had written a dissertation on Bavink as a dogmatic theologian. Mm. And uh, the last one was uh, Professor Jan Veenhoff from the Free University, who had written a very large dissertation on uh, revelation and inspiration in Bave. But um, yeah, the, those were the only four living people who had written. In fact, the only four people up to that point who had written mm. dissertations on Bave's theology, which is to me has been very interesting because um, there were, within the decade of Bob Vink's death, there were four major studies on Bob Vink's pedagogy and on his educational philosophy. <clears throat> so the initial scholarly interest in Bob Vink was not on his theology, but on his uh, mm. educational philosophy. And, and that's really how he became best known in North America in the Mm. broader Christian reformed orbit as well. It was the Christian school uh, teachers and the Christian school professors of education at Calvin College who brought Bavink's pedagogy uh, to the awareness of teachers in North America. His Mm. theology sort of was on the back burner um, so, which is strange because <clears throat> uh, Bavink was best known in the Netherlands, of course, too, for being a theologian. Mm-hmm. And yet, uh, in the Netherlands, I, there are reasons for that because in the Netherlands, after Bavink's death, Uh, a number of uh, uh, several different sort of forces or streams of thought led to Bavink not, Bavink being seen as someone who was useful for his time, but no longer Mm, uh, really one who is speaking the modern theology or meeting the needs of modern theological uh, students. And that was in the Netherlands. Um, On the one hand, there was um, Professor Klaas Skelder, who 
was nervous about certain scholastic elements in Baving's theology, as he called it. And then there were the, um, the, the, the philosophers led by Hermann Doyward and mm. uh, Volen, Dirk Vollenhoven, who also um, felt that this old, <clears throat> what they called scholastic theology, needed to be updated. And then in the 1930s, uh, when uh, G.C. Berkauer began his um, work at the Free University, he really tried to do theology in what he thought was a more biblical mode. So those factors all sort of came together to kind of push Bavink, the theologian, to mm. the back burner. Interesting. It's it's interesting that uh, that was the sentiment, at least in the Netherlands, about his uh, his utility for the modern age. One thing that Joe and I have talked about on the podcast privately, and Joe's actually written about it, is one of the more compelling things about Bavink's theology and his general thought is that it's so applicable. It's as if he was looking at the modern man and writing to us from from his position in history and telling us things are on the horizon. Here's something to consider. And it seems like he was more interested in speaking to the modern man than most of the uh, theologians at the time, at least in the Netherlands. Um, so that's just one. It's curious that that's how he was interpreted you know, sort of, you know, after his death in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. One one question I think uh, to riff off of what Joe was beginning to ask you is with your work in your dissertation on Bavink about imitating Christ, did you find that there was significant overlap with your previous studies on that dissertation and the ethics that you're editing? Oh, yeah. Because this this manuscript wasn't quite discovered when you originally wrote. Is that is that right? Oh no! <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I, I should. Um, you know, I I went I, I went ahead and I published my dissertation in 2013 after uh, the uh, ethics manuscript had been discovered, and I added a postscript. And I pointed out that um, when I was defending my dissertation, my supervisor told me, now look, it's a strategy I've passed on to my doctoral yeah. students many times. Whenever you can, in answering a question, appeal to a specific document or text. So. You know, don't just say, well, you know, Calvin doesn't seem to agree with this. You say, no, no, no. In Institutes 341, he defends the distinction between sanctification and justification. I'm doing this all out of the top of my head because sure, I know sure. roughly that's where that is. But, <laughs> uh, so, but the point is, appeal to a specific text. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I commented uh, in my postscript that uh, had my examiners known about the existence of the ethics manuscript, um, their response would have been either, well, the, <laughs> of course, Bavink says it right here, your thesis. Right. Bavink himself in this man in this these lecture notes says the heart of the imita of the Christian ethic is the imitation of Christ. And I, I commented, you know, that here you are. And arguably, you know more about the subject of your dissertation than anybody else, including your examiners. Hmm. And um, here, after all that, and being so knowledgeable about this. I didn't even know hmm. of this one very important text. Well, it was, it was hidden in the archives, of course. But I, 
had they known about it, they would have said, well, you know what, Bolt, you got to go back and you got to start all over again because your the thesis of your dissertation is so obvious. Hmm. All this work you did really doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, I, I think that my the method that I used in my dissertation, which was very inductive, you know, I, I uh, drew from a lot of stuff more broadly involving, but also from his historical context, some of the conflicts with Abraham Kuyper. So, you know, I, I decided, hey, I, I should publish this dissertation because the method is still valid. But I did say that it's a little humbling. And mm. then I said, which is probably not a bad place. <laughs> Yeah. A reminder to, to Philippians 2, it's probably not a bad place to enter dissertation on this topic, because uh, yep. it really was. It was it was really very humbling to me to discover, and I didn't discover it, of course, but one of my close friends, Dirk uh, Dirk. who for him to come out and say my sis was vindicated is he breaking up for you dale yeah oh okay. i think you uh broke up for oh let me uh see if i can it looks like you're breaking up just a little bit there dr bolt let's see if did that... we lose okay i thought for a minute i lost you Oh, yeah. It, it looks like you broke up for just a second there. We both lost you for a second. I think when you, you were, were talking about your uh, friend's discovery of the manuscript. Yes, right. Yeah. I said it, it's, it was very satisfying. I came home. I'm very excited, of course, and told my wife. But it was also a reminder of, hey, you know, all our knowledge is limited and finite. And mm. it, was, it, was, it was both exaltation and you know very humbling yeah, yeah. Right. It, was, it was a really wonderful thing to experience yeah what do you what do you think one of the things that i i find fascinating and there's you know it's a good segue to just talking about this this fresh volume that's come out this is obviously there's three volumes and this particular volume is focused on the the duties of the christian life uh and anybody who's sort of floated in the hemisphere of American reformed evangelicalism uh, knows that we have a, uh, a kind of dialectic of visions of the Christian life where think themes like the imitation of Christ or duty, uh, whether we're motivated by grace or, you know, whether it's grace or how much effort is required in the Christian life, that sort of thing. How do you balance those things? You know, when you read Bavink, there's just such a fragrance of, uh, of of balance on this, both a kind of centrality of the gospel, but also a, a detailed recognition of what it actually looks like to work out godliness in a life. And I wonder if maybe you just have a, you know, before we get into a specific or two, if you have a, a sort of general thought about Bavink's relevance for, I think, a general vision of sanctification, I guess. Like, it, it seems to me like a lot of discussion, even theological discussion among theologians about sanctification or, you know, the label antinomian is kind of thrown around all the time in loose ways. It seems like sometimes there's a, um, I don't know, I, I don't know if I hear great balance on either side. And yet when I read Bavink, I find great balance. I wonder how you think he would script into those, those tensions. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you picked that up because uh, in my introduction to the second volume, uh, that the introduction, uh, to some degree, reflects experiences I had at conferences, where I find found that the people who loved the first volume of the ethics were a little disconcerted by the fact that in the second volume, Bavink, quote, regresses back to the mm -hmm. old talk about duty and commandments and so forth. That they found that a, a sort of a lap going, you know, backwards. And um, I, I, as I told one of my friends, 
The only reason that you think this is going backwards is because you're very fond of Karl Barth, and I'm not. <laughs> um, and you know that was meant to say, you know, this was sort of way friends can kid each other. But that's right. But there's some truth to it because yeah. you see the problem with. 20th century ethics that has been, and, you know, broad Christian ethics, including evangelical ethics, it's that it has been bitten by what I will call uh, the Anabaptist bug. Mm. Um, and, you know, I say that with, with having all kinds of respect for the cost of discipleship that the Anabaptist tradition stands for. Hmm. But um, as I indicated in my preface, uh, when Yoder is critical of ethics that uses the Ten Commandments because, quote, he says, it has nothing to do with Jesus. First hmm. of all, I think he is theologically simply wrong. Yeah. But the problem is that ethics even for Christians, cannot restrict itself to the life or the teachings of Jesus. Uh, and I think theologically that's the case because Jesus, I read somewhere that Jesus actually didn't come to demolish the law. Um, right. <laughs> but, you know, I think I heard that too. Is yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. I'm glad. I, you know, I'm yeah. not mistaken about that. <laughs> yes. It, the, the idea, you know, Jesus affirms the fullness of creation. So it's for Christians, it's not sufficient. But especially if you ask yourself the question, what about people who are non believers? N neither. Jews nor Christians do not consider the Bible in any sense to be relevant to their ethics. Do they have no guides at all in their lives? And the answer is, of course, from we know that from experience, but we also know it from biblical teaching, Romans 2, uh, that, you know what? There is a way in which we are created. Mm -hmm. that we have an affinity for, a capacity for <clears throat> discerning moral what's morally right from what's morally wrong. And so, of course, you know, I mean, I think of the Jesus many, you know, but I say unto you, and he intensifies and he makes um, commandments like, hatred, killing, and adultery, and so on, that much deeper with his drawing out that we bear these sins in our heart. But an ethic, a Christian ethic, just absolutely needs the law. And so I don't, um, I guess I, I've never fully understood uh, Christian ethicists who want to go all in for union with Christ, um, for character formation and virtue formation, all of which I think are wonderful things and very important. But you know what? Sometimes you just have to tell a five-year-old child, sorry, Johnny, it's wrong to steal a cookie out of the cookie jar when mommy tells you you shouldn't. Now, you know, yeah, you, you want Johnny finally to develop the kind of character in which he isn't going to do what mommy says he's not supposed to do. But, yeah, you know what? In the meantime, hey, yeah, you just have to tell him, thou shalt not. Yeah, you know, this has played a critical, exactly mm -hmm. what you're describing has played a critical role in the way that I parent my children, actually. So to keep with your uh, analogy, um, I have two children. My oldest is 14 and my youngest is seven. 
So there's a pretty big gap there. So I learned a lot of things between the first and the second one. Um, and uh, when children are young, they need a lot of law. They, le they need a lot of you should not do that. Do not do that over and over and over again until there's a habituated relationship with the laws of the home. When they mature and they start to develop more cognitive abilities and they start to reason a bit more deeply and widely, and you can explain the reasons that undergird the you shall not, then that's called wisdom, right? You're, you're now becoming yes. wiser. Yes. And the older they get, it's less of you shall not and it's more like look at the consequences of how it will uh, cash out if you continue down this particular road and i think that when we talk about sanctification we are talking about something analogous to that development from a baby to an adult and i think the proverbs actually present foolishness in terms of childishness and wisdom in terms of the hoary haired gray man that's lived a long life. Um, so um, maybe at the beginning of our, our, our journey, I hate to use that term, so I'm not gonna use that term. Maybe <laughs> at the beginning of our walk with Christ, we need the law, we need the third use of the law to function more pedagogically and when, when we mature, then the it's less of a thou shalt not, and it's more of a, do you understand, you understand the thou shalt nots, do you understand the reason now more deeply for the, the thou shalt nots? The internalized principle. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And discipleship becomes more mature in its, in the way that it's, a, the, discipleship becomes more mature in its method than a simple thou shalt not. But you yeah. can't get there if you don't first start with thou shalt nots, I guess. Yeah. Well, it's in it's like learning uh, scales before you can uh, play jazz hmm. on a piano. Yeah. No, you know, you know, and, and you know, I'm, I sort of uh, did a bit of a riff on people who get rid of the law. But I mean, I understand that it, it's not useful. To think of the Christian life, and particularly not, I would say, then, Christian life in community as a situation where we carry <clears throat> a little book in our pockets with 76 rules, and we've got to say, yes. okay, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know if either of you are fans of uh, NCIS, but... Um, the uh, lead character played by Mark Harmon has a series of rules. And they're all numbered. And so he'll talk, you know, rule number eight and rule, nine, you know, and the, his, his co uh, laborers in the, uh, you know, sort of know some of these rules. Now, yeah. I, you know, okay. Uh, but that's not the way that in terms of mm. our relationships with each other, you know, the more intimate they are, they're not sort of overshadowed by ruled behavior. And I, that's right. Um, but, you know, there, there's so much that has happened. And, and, you know, I'm not retired. But during the 30 years that I taught at the seminary level, so often I would come across people who catch good insights on something. And, and uh, you know, if they kept them as a kind of enrichment of an idea, mm -hmm. would really help the church. But then they go mm. <clears throat> and they create these uh, conflicts. Oh, you know what? Yeah. The church is not about maintenance. It's about mission. Hmm. Well, slow down a minute. Um, that's not true. It's not true <laughs> in any organization. You know, <laughs> right. it's, it's not true. For heaven's sake, it's not true of your automobile that you need to go to work. Yeah. And, you know, besides that, to call pastoral care 
such as the visitation to a dying person and spending hours with a dying person so that they're comforted by your prayers, by family standing around and singing hymns with such a person. That's not maintenance, that's love. I mean, I, yeah. you know, there's yeah. this notion that unless you're sort of this gung-ho entrepreneurial activist, you're not really mm -hmm. doing your job. And I, but all I use, I use that illustration just simply to say that this happens over and again, also, again, also in ethics. Not this, but that. Um, it, I used to tell my students, if you run, a, if you ever hear that said, let all your antenna go bzzz because yeah. something's mm. not right. Um, if someone says, well, you know, in addition to, you know, and, and maybe we ought to qualify this a little bit by that, that's helpful. Mm. And I think that that's so true for ethics. Mm. Um, Amen. Well, Bovink, one of the things I, I detect when I read Bovink, both in uh, uh, when I was reading Eglinton's recent biography of Bovink and, and some sections in this. Uh, he has a, one of the ways in which you see, I think, an, a, a magnanimity and an attractiveness to his ethics is that on the one hand, he's, he's, he's sort of organizing it in terms of duty. And yet he's working through each of the duties, both in their biblical and kind of natural law content, for back, lack of a better term, yep. to, sort of, to sort of show their fragrance for the human. The kingdom is the fullness of God for the human. Each of these duties is actually, he expects, you know, he's, he's less the antithesis maker. He's the, he's the person yep. aiming in his rhetoric to say, this is just actually attractive. There's a register that the human nature just fires as attractive toward this. But one of the ways in which I think he bathes all of that in the fragrance of the gospel, and, and Dale and I've talked about this a couple of times on the podcast, uh, is he has a real pastoral eyeball on human weakness. Uh, mm. And so he, uh, our, one thing that was fascinating in the, uh, in the Eglinton biography is Eglinton points out that Bavink gets nervous about developments he sees in uh, 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 Dutch pedagogy because the spirit of competition and the allergy toward the weak he saw developing and kind of anticipating in, in concert with the German spirit, right? That's going to be developed. Yes. That that, whereas the Christian ethic has always stared at the weak and said, hey, you strong, bear with the weak guys who have a harder time. And all through this, his discussion of suicide, for instance, there's a, a kind of a beautiful line where Bavink says something to the effect of, we don't judge a person for a single action. Ultimately, God's judgment is for a whole life. Some people, and he has a, a beautiful discussion of temperament even. And there's just mm -hmm. a, there's a, 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 a heart that has a very fine grained reading of the fullness of a human and the range of human experiences that can be represented in the Christian. And that just makes you know, it rich. You know, yeah. uh, to put it differently, he is not a Kantian. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and it, I, I wish now I could remember exactly where, but something I worked on, I think in one of the chapters that I'm working on in the third volume, but I can't, he, he really uh, castigates that Kantian tradition for its coldness for its mm. uh, failure to have to take into account human weaknesses and human needs and so on so yeah uh, Bavink you know if you have read um, the Bavink review James Eglinton uh, included in their um, translation of a letter we, we got a, a translation of a letter that uh, Bavink had written to one of the Kumpen students who was very ill and was dying. And it just is filled with warmth and care and, and deep Christian testimony about the hope that we have in Christ. It's, um, yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> 
in his um, biography of Bob Inc., Brimmer alludes to someone who was a member of the congregation that in Franeker, Friesland, that Bothing served for only two years. Right. From 81 and 82. And um, it was about care for mentally handicapped members of the congregation who are brought to church and so forth. And I mean, it's, it's a really remarkable vignette. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing that I think we would take note of today. Mm -hmm. But for him to do it in 1880, Mm. is just wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. This this also speaks to um Bovink has a pretty significant section uh in this volume of the ethics on self-care. Yes, he does. Um, mm. and which in this in our in the modern age where uh self-care has sort of been um taken over by the secular psychological mm -hmm. and psychiatry community and turned into uh, poisonous forms of self-expressive individualism, as Carl Truman notes in his recent book. Yeah, isn't that a wonderful um, book, by the way? It was yes. very good. Yeah, yeah. I appreciated uh, it. Yeah. Fabulous. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But then you, we see talked the with him. you see the reformed kind of like the reaction to that is sort of like the, the, the kind of conservative reformed, well, oh, no, not psychology. Oh, the, the self-help, self-esteem stuff. And, and again, you kind of go back to Bavink, and this is one way in which he's modern of a sort. Is that oh, yeah. there's oh, this, this robust very. section on the self, but it's but it's oriented toward a self care in its most legitimate sense, rather than its. It, I think by comparison, a lot of what we experience yeah. is parody. Uh, uh, really, yeah, yeah. And he he's very clear that um, he rejects the notion of self love. Right. You know, that, that there were ethicists who were doing that, you know, saying, well, love your neighbor as yourself, you know, Amur Sui, you know. Well, no, Bavink says no. Um, I mean, he explores all that. He does and, explore and, you know, it. Th this yeah. is the thing that yeah. is so magnificent about him. He, when you're reading him and he's summarizing somebody else's point of view, you have to really watch that carefully because you think, I think thinks that no, no. Yes. He's <laughs> he, he summarizes good. other people so fairly. Yeah. Which is yeah. I mean, in, in that respect, I find not only the actual content of mm. this uh, work of Bavings on ethics very helpful. I mean, I found the first volume the uh, chapter, especially the chapter on the imitation of Christ, but also the, the, the material on conscience. That, that's the part that really took me the longest time to edit carefully because I was working with Bavink uh, citing um, uh, John Owen and, uh, oh, come on, the other... <laughs> Now the name escapes me. Um, the, the Puritan. Uh, not Owen, but... Cromwell? It can't be Cromwell. It was Owen. <clears throat> oh, it is Owen. Okay. It is Owen, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And the casuistry. Cases of conscience and so on. And... Uh, ah. Hmm. I, you know, he, he cites all this stuff. And he uses an edition that's in Dutch from 1650. Calvin was one of two places in all of North America that had a copy of that in its rare books room. Mm -hmm. So I would be sitting down in the rare books room and I'd have my laptop with the Latin text. I'd have... Uh, uh, 
the English translation next to me and I'd have this 1650 book <laughs> with hmm. pages that were still almost pristine. No acid used, of course. And I'd be doing this back for it. It was fun. I even got a couple of my students involved in doing it and they thought it was fun too. Yeah. Um, but what Bavink does on conscience mm. is I, I have not seen anything in recent works on ethics that picks up uh, Owens that picks up um, William Ames's cases, cases of conscience in actually brings them into dialogue with modern writers about conscience. Mm. I mean, he has a whole section on, uh, you know, he picks up Schleiermacher, he picks up other mm. 19th century figures. So that part of Vavink, um, all that usefulness, it is so relevant for today. Yeah. 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 I, so what if you were to say, what is the what is the point so you mentioned because i noticed this when i was reading bob Inc. on self-love and i actually uh got into a bit of a disagreement with a friend of mine because i was like no bob Inc. affirms self-love and he's like no he doesn't and i'm like i'm reading bob Inc. right now on self-love and he's like keep reading i'm like okay i'll keep reading i had to go back with my tail between my legs and be like okay i see i had to read a bit more carefully <laughs> uh because you're right he does present his opponent or not his opponents but whatever he's sort of using his dialogue to, partners his dialogue partners yes but in uh, i'm interested to hear your opinion of the use of bovink's understanding of self-care in the modern evangelical context, not particularly for um, the weak, uh, but maybe the hyper competent, uber self confident people that would look at anyone that thought about self care in disparaging ways and consider those who talk about self care as not, you know trusting Jesus enough, or, you know, looking for escape hatches in moral quandaries, like you're blaming the fact that you're sinning on this because you're weak here. And you think you need to like tend to yourself before you can become righteous or whatever. And that's a weakness. You shouldn't have to do that. What does Bob Inc. have to say to someone like that? Well, um, yeah, you know, it, it's interesting. You, you're, you're bringing up kinds of people that um, aren't in the first place in my sort of thinking about the kind of people who would be responding to Bobby. Well, his whole, you know, it's part of love your neighbor. Um, and you know, well, this is a little trivial, but you know, when I watch the news at night, there are all these ads for uh, these public service announcements about, you know, make sure you get vaccinated, love your neighbor. Hmm. Okay. Well, the, the point is that self-care is a form of neighbor love mm -hmm. as Bavink formulates it. And I think that that's a helpful way to think about it. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, obviously, it's a neighbor love that's expressed to people who are the closest to you. Um, but then even because, you know, they want you to be there. Um, yeah. But it's also an expression of neighbor love in this way. If we don't take care of ourselves properly, 
and we become incapable of doing the th kinds of things that express neighbor love, then we're also sort of by a sin of omission in which we've created the conditions for sins of omission through our lack of self-care. Now, you know, that's sort mm -hmm. of a long argument, but I do think uh, the way that he formulates it in terms of being part of love of neighbor, mm. And not just, you know, it, it's not so that you can run and win a marathon. Right. Um, Self-care is part of being able to live to the fullest as an image bearer of God mm. and loving your, and being able to love your neighbor. Yeah. Jordan Peterson has this, whom I'm sure you're aware of. Uh, oh yes, has this interesting line. I think along the lines of treat treat yourself as somebody you're responsible for helping, and I think that's an you know that's yeah. an interesting that's an interesting way I think to relate to self care is because you you treating yourself as somebody you're responsible for helping is actually treating yourself in a way as an as a as an agent who's an image of God whose image is expressed precisely in your ability to give to the community and to love them. And, and in fact, maybe that's a, as we sort of move toward a, a, a winding down here, or time is almost up. There's a line in here that, uh, that I, I'd love a, a thought on. And what do you think Bovink's ethics contributes to this? One of the things Bovink has an eyeball on, you mentioned mission versus maintenance. It's a funny, I, I feel the same reaction <laughs> that you do to that as a, as a dialectic. But Bovink says on, on page 20, uh, Christians are obligated to perform their duty out of gratitude and love toward God in order from that to be assured of their own faith and to win over their neighbors. And an interesting element of all that Bovink is doing in this volume is he sees the, the life that this describes as a kind of fragrance for the neighbor. That seems to be an orientation in his ethic is that a lot of the Christian life is about putting out a fragrance that draws the, the neighbor into the orbit of Christ uh, and the spirit. Um, and that's a, we all say that, I guess. <laughs> Every, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a thing that's said in a bunch of Sunday school classes. And yet you get the sense in Bovink that there's a burden in a sense to yeah. feel the fragrance at each step of the way, rather than to just say that. And I wonder if you have a thought about how the, the kind of missional element of ethics does uh, factor in in Bobbing. Yeah. Oh, very, it's very important. You know, um, he takes that, as he often does, just from his own sort of personal stock of knowledge of, of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's the, what the Heidelberg Catechism says about why we should do good works. Um, but yeah, that... Um, and I think you'll see that uh, in the third volume, which mm. is um, was in the outline to be about social ethics. Unfortunately, he only got the section on marriage and family done. Mm. And so, but we know that he wanted to also do a whole chapter on society uh, one on um, art and science, scholarship, one on the church, and one on the state. So what we're doing <coughs> for that third volume is that the chapters in which he gave us the title and indicated what he wanted, we're filling it in. I'm, I'm sort of creating a... Uh, composite of Bavink's writings ah. on that, those topics mm. and, um, you know, filling it in with the narrative. And it, it, it's very clear where my narrative starts and where Bavink's own words, they'll be set apart in italics. Um, but in those, in one on society, his 
concern for things like justice, but also for things like the diaconal ministry of the church. Um, in education, hmm. we, you mentioned already, you know, his, his concern to take seriously the developmental levels of children and also to take into account the, con <coughs> the confessional uh, diversity so that parents have the freedom and the opportunity and resources to uh, have their mm -hmm. children educated in their own uh, beliefs. In all those things, the ethical push outward is, is very important. Hmm. Um, I've been working on the one on science and scholarship um, and I've taken a lot of material which I've then translated from a um, larger work called Chris Lickavatenskop or Christian Scholarship. And um, he, he explores, you know, positivism and the modern, more naturalistic kinds of scholarship. And one of the things that runs through this as a critique is that they don't really help people. They, you know, scholarship for the sake of scholarship on its own. He mm. dislikes. Right. Um, I mean, he's for pure science and all that, but <clears throat> he always for life. tries yeah. to place it in the context mm. of a nation and a community. Mm. So yeah. it's in those, um, in the third volume, I think you'll see much more of that. Mm. Mm. And by the way, I double checked it. It's William Perkins that I was thinking of, not John. Uh, oh, okay, gotcha. Yep. Yes. Yep. I was going to say Perkins that, of course. So of and course, Dale you know, was going to say Perkins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No worries. It so my mind. Yeah. No, well, Doctor Bolt, let me. Um, this will be the last question I have for you, and then yeah. Joe, if you want to. No, I'm good. Um, and this is more for you personally um, as a bond as a bovink influenced. Um, man who is full of wisdom. Um, what would you say are some of the things that younger Christians looking at the future, let's say the Lord tarries for another 5,000 years, uh, with all of the ethical questions on the horizon that future generations are going to have to parse out within the church, things like AI, IVF, all of these sort of gray unknown areas where Christian ethics are going to have to give a voice. Is there anything that you could offer the younger generation coming up uh, as a way of uh, guiding principles that they should keep in front of them uh, that's both rooted in orthodoxy, but also an eye towards the modern world? Okay. Um, well, I, not necessarily in any order, but mm -hmm. I think the first thing is, I think the key to good Christian ethics is anthropology. Uh, in other words, I think a really grounded understanding of what it is to be a human being. Yes. I think that obviously it has to be grounded, first of all, in scripture, the image of God, and everything that scripture says about human sinfulness. But then it also, I think, maybe the most important thing for Christian ethicists is to really be grounded in the wisdom of the Christian tradition. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes that's made is 
to think that, well, we've got all these modern questions that obviously uh, Herman Bavick, Jonathan Edwards, and John Calvin, not to mention St. Paul, knew nothing about. So therefore, I'm going to study bioethics and I'm going to become, get a really a good degree in biology and well, and you know, then, okay, obviously you have to know, if you're going to be a bioethicist, you have to know biology. Sometimes Christians say stupid things and that's, <laughs> that's, that's not helpful ethically. But, you know, when I think of people that I really value um, as Christian bioethicists. I think of uh, Gilbert Mylander is one. Uh, they know the Christian tradition. They, they're they just rooted in a, especially a Christian anthropology. What does it mean? To, and you know, Christians are going to be the only ones left standing <coughs> who are going to continue to defend the dignity of every human being. Mm. Uh, the utilitarians are among us. And um, we're getting this Nazi idea of uh, Lebenswert, you know, a life right. worth, worth living. living. Well, yeah. um, you know what? Is this person a human being? Yeah, well, I guess. Well, I'm sorry. The fact that they have Down syndrome or the fact that, you know, they are unable to walk or whatever. Yeah, life unworthy of life. In no yeah. way do Christians, I mean, you know, I, one of the things I have frustrations with is that Christians are getting caught up in all the trendy worries of this day. All the apocalyptic anxiety about climate change and so on. Well, you know, I'm, I'm firmly committed to saying we have to be as responsible stewards of God's world as we can possibly be. Uh, my son's an architect, and he has designed a number of LED certified schools. I'm profoundly grateful for that. I believe in that. But you know what? If we concede to the killers among us, hmm. a rising ocean is not going to be our biggest problem. It's going yeah. to be the world equivalent of sticking COVID-19 people in nursing homes because they don't matter that much. Hmm. stand up and be strong about all the others don't matter yeah yeah that's uh that's a. Uh, I think that's very profound and, and one of the uh i guess I'll, yeah, I'll make one 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 very minor last comment or and i'll give you a chance to say what you think about it i it's interesting. I see that happening on, I think, on all sides. Is that uh, even though technically we're the people of life, Christians are the side that, uh, uh, at a principled level, are supposed to be pro-life. Nevertheless, in terms of uh, rhetorical posturing and culture wars and such, there's this instrument. There's a language that's an instrumentalization of people. You see the heart of the instrumentalization of the other, where there really is this, this. Uh, 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 kind of tendency toward projection of the worst on everybody who uses some oh, sure. word, all that sort of thing. Uh, and it seems like a, a sickness in our, almost in our civilization everywhere. And the, and the, oh, yeah, what we need yeah. is kind of a deeper sense of the, the sacredness of a, of a, of a human face, any of them, <laughs> you know, that we see. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, I entirely agree with you on that. Um, I mean, I've, I've read and reviewed books that I really disagree with. But I think 
it be worth people who disagree with the book and the author, nonetheless, asking themselves, do I, have I really understood him or her? Mm. Um, right. Because if you have, then you got to be able to say, well, you know, okay, I don't go that for that. You know, there are a couple of points here that I do need to ponder a little bit more. Hmm. Um, yeah, we're not in a situation like that in our world where that happens. Hmm. Yep. Yeah, and that's that's an anthropological flaw too. Hmm. Um, it's a failure to acknowledge that even those with whom we d disagree are first of all human beings and fellow image bearers of God. Hmm. And you know, and if they're brothers or sisters in Christ, for us to be creating those walls and barriers is doubly awful. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I we could have a whole nother podcast <laughs> That's right. just on this subject. You guys, <laughs> you guys are wonderful conversation partners and starters. I'd, I'd love to. Oh, thank you. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> good to hear. We're encouraged. And, and thank you, Doctor Bolt. We appreciate yes. your time, brother. And oh, we yeah, we'll love to have work. you back on for volume three. Uh, well, uh, indeed. Yeah, that'll be a while. Um, <laughs> no, well, here's here's the deal on that. Um, you know, our editorial team gets together, was ever since 2015, had got together for two weeks in the summer to go very carefully over this manuscript. Um, in 2020 and 2021, COVID made that impossible. Mm. Now, Lord willing, we are scheduled to do that this summer. If we succeed in doing that, then I should have volume three in to Baker by the end of this year or, you know, early oh, good. January, February next year. And then th they take usually a good year. Yeah. But once it's out of my hands, I mean, I, yeah, it's never out of my hands because until the, right. the book is finally printed, I, I get set proofs. So I got to go over them, and editorial proof editor, uh, proof copiers, queries and all that. But that's okay then I, I'm really fairly confident that my major work on the third volume uh, will be done by the end of this year. And I know oh, we wonderful. keep saying we're going to leave, but uh, is there a, another bobbing translation project after that? <laughs> Not for me. Okay. No, no. Um, you know, what's so wonderful about the last decade is that all these young Baving scholars, Gray Sutanto yeah. uh, and others, Corey Brock, uh, and, mostly uh, students yeah. of James Eglinton, yeah. um, mm -hmm. they've gone around and they've translated stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Christian worldview, a new translation of the philosophy of revelation. Um, Psychology on, is coming uh, out. Um, sacrifice of praise. Uh, and then, yeah. So, and I, you know, hey, that's what I want <laughs> yeah. to have happen. I want a younger generation to pick up Good. this torch and run with it. Yes. Um, yes. I've got other projects that I'm, I have in mind if the yeah. Lord gives me health and strength that uh, I'm quite happy to let others keep doing the wonderful work they're doing. Mm. Excellent. Well, thank you, brother. We appreciate thank you. you. Yes. And thank yes. you for having me. And for being great conversation partners. Yeah, I really appreciate pleasure. that. You make yes. you make being interviewed very easy. Good. <laughs> <laughs> That's our goal here. That's right. Uh, and, jo and Joe and I, uh, we, we've, um, we've, we've uh, approached interviews that way because it's awkward when people make it awkward for us. <laughs> so we're loving our neighbors oh, yeah. as we love ourselves. <laughs> so, well, you know, uh, that's that part of the, uh, Person, the responsible person of being interviewed is to not be awkward and make other people awkward. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. that's part yeah, of. That's right. <laughs> it's a mutual. Let's thing. just not be weird. Yeah. That's a good, that, that's <laughs> there our you motto. go. 
There you yes. go. There you go. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, thanks uh, thank lot, you, guys. brother. Yes. And Joe, I love you. Love you too, man. Uh, you guys can always catch us on DavenantInstitute.org um, and head over to the YouTube channel. We're on all the podcast stuff. Dr. Bolt, thank you for your time, brother. Thanks, and thank you. Goodbye. Bye.